Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Shelby Christian Church. My name is Dennis Dove. I'm the executive pastor here. Uh, usually I'm outside waving to you, saying we're glad you're here, but it was cold and rainy, so and I just have to wave once in here. So good to see everybody um, here today. If you're worshiping with us online, uh, it's good to have you guys as well. A couple of announcements. Uh, we have man camp coming up Friday and Saturday. Uh, weather permitting over there, so you can bring your sons, bring friends, come by yourself. Sleep on the ground and do what men do over there. Friday night and Saturday, you can sign up uh, at the website uh, for that. Also, on the 28th, so next Wednesday, is our Fall Family Fun Fest over on the new fields. Uh, so if you want to hand out candy to a bunch of kids, you can sign up for that. Uh, we need as many of those as possible. If you can't make it but have candy, we need as much candy as possible, too. So there's baskets out by the doors that you guys can uh, bring some candy uh, next Sunday for that. And there's also other things about setup crew, takedown crew, parking, a lot of opportunities. If you go to the website, uh, you can uh, see those and sign up for, for those opportunities as well. So right now, I want everyone to uh, stand up, give a, a friendly wave or point to your neighbor, and get ready to worship God. Glad you're here.
give you pure exaltation and open the heavens receive what is yours Jesus receive what is yours Word.
Amen. Worthy are you, God. That's awesome. Have a seat, guys. As we enter into this time of communion and offering, uh, after I pray, we have stations around the room. You can come up if you haven't already and, and grab uh, the cup and the bread and drop off the offerings in the, in the black boxes and worship through your giving that way. But as we come to this time, for me, um, every time we come to the community, I think about the, the, the body of Christ broken and, and the blood. Uh, it reminds me of a story when I was in college, a guy came to speak for Spiritual Renewal Week and he talked about, he was a veteran um, and he and his buddy uh, were there and a hand grenade came in and his buddy handed him the chocolate bar that he was eating and jumped on the grenade and died um, for him. And then he went later um, to his, his buddy's uh, parents' house and said, you know, do you think he loved me? And the mom just started crying and said, you know, what more could he have done for you? What more could he have done for you? And that's just what I think about every time I, I take the communion with Christ. What more could he have done for me? That he loved me so much that he came down and he died for me. So as we think of that song and how worthy he is of our praise, let's pray and think about what Christ did for us. Let's pray. Dear God, you're awesome. And just help us come now and just clean our minds of thoughts of other things and just help us to focus on you. Help us to focus on your love and what you've done for us. And help us to honor you in everything we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
This is how I This is how I fight my battles This is how I fight my battles This is how I fight my battles This is how I And your mercy follow me So my weapons of praise and thanksgiving This is how I fight my battles This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I. Sing this out when you feel like you're surrounded. It may look like you are. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded but I'm surrounded by you this is how I fight my battles this is how I fight my battles this is how I fight my battles this is how I this is how I fight my battles this is how I fight my battles yes this is how I fight my battles this is how I It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I. Thank you, Jesus, for standing in the battles with us. Thank you for surrounding us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring. We praise you today, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Woo! Man, I'm glad you guys are here today. You ready to go to war? Let's go. Let's go. Man, you guys were awesome this morning, by the way. Man. 
was a junior in high school in the winter of 1977. And in December of, on December 4th of 1977, in Bangoy, Central Africa, there was an amazing event. It was the coronation of the Imperial Majesty Bukasa I. The price tag for that single day event in 1977 was $25 million dollars for that single day event. Now, I just want to read to you because I couldn't keep up and memorize all the statistics. I just want to read to you what uh, the Newsweek magazine said about that event. It said at 10, 10 a.m. that morning, the blare of trumpets and the roll of drums announced the approach of his majesty. The procession began with the family, including the future heir to the throne, dressed in a white admiral's uniform with gold braid. He was seated on a red pillow uh, to the left of the throne. Catherine followed the favorite of Bukasa's nine wives. We may have a problem there. Uh, she was wearing a $73,000 gown made by Lavin of Paris, strewn with pearls that she had picked out herself. The emperor arrived in an imperial coach decked with gold eagles and drawn by six matched Anglo-Norman horses. When the marine band blared the sacred march of his majesty, Emperor Bukasa, his highness stepped out of the carriage, cloaked with his 32-pound robe decorated with, get this, 785,000 pearls and gold embroidery. White gloves adorned his hands, pearl slippers and his feet, and on his head he wore a gold crown of laurel wreaths like those worn by the Roman consuls of old, a symbol of the favor of the gods. As the sacred march came to a conclusion, Bukasa himself, seated on his $2.5 million eagle throne, took his gold laurel reed off, and as Napoleon 173 years earlier had done, took his $2.5 million crown, which was topped with an 80 carat diamond, and placed it upon his own head. At 1043, December 4th, the 20th century saw a new emperor. Less than 40 minutes, a little over 30 minutes, all that took place to the price tag of $25 million. We meet today in our scripture in Luke 19, we're going to see a different kind of of coronation, a completely different kind of coronation. As we move into our, our next mini-series in this year-long study through the Gospel of Luke, we're coming to the end of it. We're in the next to last mini-series. This one's called The Atoning Sacrifice, and it's in this last, very last part of Luke chapter 19. But here's what I want you to do right now. I want you to think for a minute. And if you're watching online, we're glad that you're watching online with us. In fact, I was just checking out. we got people all over the world, literally. Greg uh, and Jean are in Charlotte. Charlotte, Kayla's out in Washington State. Tyler's watching from Germany right now. So everybody wave to those people way far away. Man, we're glad you guys are with us. And uh, almost 200 people were in first service online, that many more this service. But so if you're online, I want you to type this in the comment bar. But if you're right here, I want you to think about it. Maybe tell the person next to you. Think about this for a minute. What is the most extravagant, over-the-top, outrageous kind of event you've ever been invited to. Okay, now wait a minute. There's like any good teacher, there's a follow-up question to that, okay? And did it meet your expectations? Okay, go. Are you telling anybody? All right, now, I want to tell you about this coronation. It starts in Luke chapter 19, verse 28. See if this sounds similar to the previous one we read about and when he had said all these things, this being Jesus, Jesus went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount of the mountain called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples ahead saying, go to the village in front of you and where you are entering, you'll find a goat, a goat tied up on which no one has ever sat, untie it and bring it here to me. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say to them, because the Lord has need of it. Wow. No $25 million carriage, no crowns or anything like that, just a coat. 
a colt to ride on. So unlike the coronation of Bukasa or any of the royal weddings, Princess Diana, any of those things that we have witnessed in our lifetime, Jesus' arrival into Jerusalem for the final time is much less magnificent. There's much less splendor involved in this century. Now, just so you'll know, from a geographical standpoint, Bethany, that is mentioned here, he talks about it. Bethany is about two miles away from Jerusalem. And Bethpage is kind of almost halfway in between that. So he would come down through Bethany, and that's where a lot of the things that we have seen coming out of Jericho that we've been the last couple of weeks, down through Bethany. Bethany is the place where Lazarus and Mary and Martha lived. And then Bethpage was probably the place where the coat was. And so he comes down there, and, and it's also interesting to me, look back at the very last sentence of verse 31, that when he says, if anybody confronts you, tell them the Lord has need of it. It's really one of the first times that Jesus referred to himself as the Lord. He just put it out there now that, okay, yeah, if anybody questions you about that, that colt, that donkey, just tell them the Lord has need of it because he's making a triumphal entry into the city. And as he makes this triumphal entry, Jesus comes in as an exalted king. He purposely entered Jerusalem as a king because that's, scripture, that's what Scripture said that he would do. In the Old Testament, the book of Zechariah, it's at the end of the Old Testament. <clears throat> in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, the prophet says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation. That's what Jesus was coming to bring. And gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so Jesus enters Jerusalem as an exalted king. Not with the pomp and circumstance that we read about in history, but with a different kind of entrance, but still as an exalted king. Let's go back and look and see what Luke says. Let's skip down to verse 38, or excuse me, verse 35. And they brought this colt to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. They make this kind of makeshift saddle for him. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down, he's making his final descent down into Jerusalem, coming down the Mount of Olives. The whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory, glory in the highest. But you need to understand, everyone un misunderstood his arrival. Even those disciples that are, that are crying out and they're, they're chanting and they're shouting about peace, that's really not what they wanted. Because they, they, they put up with a lot of junk. And really what they were looking for in a Messiah was a, was a takeover. They, they were looking for, especially not peace in the immediate. They kind of were hoping that Jesus was going to come in and let them have it. That he was going to make up for all the junk that they had put up with um, for all this time from the Roman authority. That's what they were really wanting. But they were like, oh yeah, and, and peace to everybody. Yeah. yeah, But they really are like, let, let, this is going to be great. And they totally misunderstood they totally misunderstood. Because you notice back there in that text that we just read, that part of it talks about they began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. They had just seen some stuff. I mean, back in Bethany, they had seen Jesus move a stone away and yell, Lazarus, come out, and dead dude came out walking. They had seen that. They had seen Jesus talk to a blind guy named Bartimaeus, and suddenly he was able to see. They had seen him talk to this crooked guy named Zacchaeus, and he had changed his life completely. They had seen some stuff, and so that part of it they were excited about. And, and so they had a story to tell. The story they were telling of Jesus was spectacular. Let me ask you real quick. What's your story of Jesus sound like? When you get to work tomorrow or school tomorrow or wherever you're going to be in the next 24 hours, and suddenly somehow 
the conversation of what you did on Sunday morning comes up. And then somebody said, well, why do you get up? You know, it was cold this morning. Why do you get up and go to church anyway? And you have that opportunity to tell your story. What's your story sound like? These guys, they had seen some stuff. What's your story sound like? How can you point people to Jesus? So here he comes as this exalted king, just like it was prophesied. People misunderstood it, and the Pharisees, the Pharisees hated it. I mean, they just flat out resented his popularity. Look at verse 37 back there in the text. It talks about how the multitude of disciples cried out. You know, I, I, I hope... I hope that if Luke were rewriting this today, that he could write about how the multitude of disciples on the hill were really praising him today, and that they were really into worship, and they were really glorifying God. I hope that's what he would say about us. But the, the Pharisees, they didn't like it at all. Verse 39 tells us, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, hey, teacher. See, they wouldn't refer to him as Lord. He had told them that it was the Lord, but they, hey, teacher, that's just like today. There's a lot of people today that will talk about Jesus was a good teacher because they know that history can't deny this guy named Jesus. The history can't deny that. The history books are full of stories about Jesus. And so they'll talk about Jesus, the great teacher. They just deny him as Lord and Messiah. And so the Pharisees were doing that in this time. Hey, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Would you tell them to shut up? That's what he was saying to them. That's what the Pharisees were saying to Jesus. Would you just tell them to be quiet? And Jesus says, I tell you, if they were silent, in other words, if I did that and they shut up, the very stones would cry out and worship and praise. That's why it's so important we worship. Because the reality is Jesus is going to be worshiped. Jesus is going to be worshiped. Our choice is, are we going to do it or are we going to let the, the rocks and the trees cry out? And so he tells the Pharisees that because the reality is Jesus... Was, the exalt, was ready to reveal himself that day, that moment, that time as the exalted king. But here's the best part. Jesus is ready to be king of our lives today. That's the best part. That's the best. If this was just a history story and it didn't apply to us today, it wouldn't be that great. But he's ready to be our king today. I think it's really important and fitting that, that this is the final mention of the Pharisees in the whole Gospel of Luke. This is the last time that Luke mentions the Pharisees at all, and they kind of manifest the same hostility toward the Lord that they've had all throughout his ministry, and his reply just made them mad, just exasperated them. i tell you the truth, if I tell them to be quiet, even the rocks will cry out. And they had no comeback for that. They, they had no comeback for that. There was nothing they could say. There was nothing they could do. But guys, there is something we can do. We can worship. We, we can cry out. We can worship Jesus as the king of our life. So this all happens on this Sunday. This is all taking place on Sunday before the resurrection Sunday, okay? But as Jesus comes in as the exalted king, we, we also need to see he also comes in as a compassionate savior, J. Vernon McGee said, more than Jesus' triumphal entry, this was his tearful entry. He was riding into Jerusalem knowing that he would be arrested and killed there by the week's end. And if this had been me or you, he said, we would have been weeping over our upcoming crucifixion, but not Jesus. Not Jesus. See, as Jesus enters the city, we see him as a compassionate Savior, and we see that compassion in his tears. Look at verses 41 and 42. It says, as Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. He said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. Remember, they were asking for peace, but they didn't even get it. But now it's hidden from your eyes. See, Jesus saw and points out their spiritual blindness. Verse 44, he goes on and says, You did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. See, 
I love, I love that we have the four Gospels of Jesus' life, and that in so many of the stories they're written about in at least two, sometimes three, a few times even four of the Gospels, because it gives us a different perspective, a different point of view. But Luke is the only Gospel writer to record or to talk about Jesus weeping over the city of Jerusalem because they couldn't see what was going on around them. It's only the second time the Gospels even talk about Jesus weeping. The other time was back up in Bethany when he showed up on the scene four days after Lazarus has died. And, and he's met with this immediate response by Mary and Martha who thought they were kind of part of his posse, his team, and they meet him with this, Jesus... If you had been here, our brother wouldn't have died. Well, thanks. Glad to see you too. Yeah. But both of them said that. And the amazing thing about that was that then later, after meeting both of them and him asking them to take them to the tomb so they could see where Lazarus was and standing there watching everybody weeping. Here's the amazing thing about it. Mary and Martha, and for that matter, the rest of the crowd there, they acknowledge that in Jesus, we believe that if you had been here, our brother wouldn't have died. It never dawned on them. He's here now. What might happen now? And Jesus wept. Not because Lazarus was dead, because he knew he could take care of that part. He wept because the people didn't understand. He wept because their faith was so small and so shallow. And so here today, now, uh, a few weeks later, he's going down into the city of Jerusalem where he's going to be crucified. And he wasn't weeping over himself. He's weeping over the lack of understanding of even those who had been following him, even those who should have known what was coming. Ha Let me, maybe you want to write this down. If you're online, maybe you want to type this in. Maybe you just want to think about it to yourself. Ha have you ever wept over someone that you knew didn't realize the damage they were doing to themselves? Maybe it was a child maybe a spouse, maybe your parent, maybe a, a neighbor or a co-worker or someone that you just saw what's going on and they didn't see it and it just like it was killing you on the inside. That's kind of how Jesus was feeling. He's going down in this city and they don't even get it. And, and so he points out their spiritual blindness, but he also tells them that some bad stuff's coming. He points out the, the coming destruction of Jerusalem. If you look at verse 43, it says, For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground and you and your children within you and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now here's the amazing thing about those two verses. It took less... It took less than four decades after Jesus' death for that to come about. Less than four decades, less than 40 years after Jesus said this, it happened. See, in A.D. 66, there's this, there's this uprising, and so Titus, the son of the emperor, was sent in to crush the rebellion. And, and then just to put an end to it completely in, in A.D. 70, A.D. 70, Jerusalem was utterly destroyed by the Romans. And get this, they did it by building a barricade around the city and charging down into the city and destroying everything, everything to the ground, just like Jesus said they were going to do. Now, he's compassionate. That doesn't sound very compassionate. Well, it is. He's warning them. He's like, if you guys don't figure this out, here's what's going to happen. It was very much warning them, but it's full of compassion. And so not only do we see his compassion in his tears, but we also see his compassion for those who are lost. See, Jesus that day, that Sunday, this Sunday that he's coming down, he didn't storm into the city. Now, he, he could have, maybe even should have, because there's already kind of all kinds of bad stuff going on. The Roman authorities already kind of doing all kinds of horrible, horrific kind of things, evil things. He could have stormed into the city, but he didn't do that. He could have, as soon as it was over, could have yelled, I told you so. 
But he didn't do that. He just cared about those that would be physically lost, but more importantly, those would be eternally lost. Once again, in the Old Testament, the book of Lamentations is a book in the middle of the Old Testament. Uh, it's a book of sorrows. It, it's written by, by Jeremiah, who's just kind of this weeping prophet who just kind of mourns and mourns. And in Lamentations chapter 3, it says, Because of the Lord's great love, his compassions never fail. They are new every morning, and great is his faithfulness. So on that Sunday... On that Sunday, we see Jesus ride down in. We see him come out of Bethany and Bethage, come by the Mount of Olives and ride down into Jerusalem as an exalted king. Uh, we see him as he's getting that, making that approach. We see him weep over the city. We see him as a compassionate savior. And, and then, there's a, then, then Monday comes, and, and we, we know it's the next day because Mark reveals it. But on Monday, we see another side of Jesus. On Monday, we see Jesus as a frustrated Lord. Look at verses 45 and verse 46. It says, he, he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you've made it into a den of robbers. See, on Monday, Jesus confronts the hypocrites. And we know this is Monday because Mark's gospel, and then we look at the parallel there, and it tells us that this was the next day. And so, and Jesus has gotten into the city. The next day he gets up, he goes to the temple, as would have been his tradition. And he sees stuff that just breaks his heart. Now, this does match up historically once again. Because history books tell us that in that time, in that day and time, a Jewish man was required once a year to pay a temple tax. And once a year that if you claim to be a Jew, you had to go to the temple and you had to pay two days wages as a temple tax. So people would have been coming to do that. You could either pay it in cash or you could pay it in some sort of some sort of sacrifice. And so that's what's going on at the temple. But, but guys, we've got to be really clear about something here. I'm almost 60 years old, and I have misunderstood, mis, or had this misinterpreted, misquoted time after time after time after time. We need to be very clear. Jesus was not upset just because they were selling stuff at the temple. Because... That could have been a very nice thing because many people traveled from great distances to get there. And so being able to bring a sacrifice, being able to bring something to give may have been difficult. So if they had just simply been there providing so that people could worship and so people could sacrifice, that could have been a good thing. What Jesus is ticked off about was the exorbitant charges. They're taking advantage. They're not helping people worship. They're taking advantage advantage of people who are trying to worship, who are trying to do the right thing, who are trying to be exorbitant. And Jesus tears over lost people in Israel and his anger at the religious leaders in the temple again reinforce something we've seen over and over again. It's been all through the gospel of Luke if you've been paying attention. <clears throat> Jesus showed compassion to lost sinners but he saved his strongest rebuke for those who pretended, pretended to be righteous, but were two-faced in their behavior and the way they lived. And so he's, he's frustrated. He's frustrated because of the actual things that he saw, but he's also frustrated because in the end of it, he wants to be Lord of all. He doesn't want to just be Lord on Sunday when he's riding in in victory. He wants to be Lord on Monday when we're going about doing whatever it is that we do. In verse 47, the last two verses of chapter 19, verse 47 says, And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on every word. See, he isn't just Lord of Sunday. He's Lord of every day. He doesn't just tell us how to carry on when we're at church. <coughs> Excuse me. Fall in Kentucky. <coughs> he wants to be Lord of everything. Lord of everything. Not just Sunday. <coughs> See, it's quite easy to put on a show on Sunday. It's an hour. 
maybe on a maybe on a day that I get emotional and get excited an hour and 10 minutes it's 70 minutes out of a week it's easy to put on that show Jesus knew it was easy even for the ones who were praising him on Sunday riding into the city it was easy to do that but what about the rest of the time see that's hard for us because we're so prone to doing our own thing and making our own decisions See, I had to wrestle with some stuff this week. I had, I had to wrestle with this, this story and this, this passage this week. Because as I studied the text, I realized that the practical application wasn't as obvious as it sometimes is. See, as we've gone through this gospel, we've looked at some things, and there's been some times that Luke has challenged us to speak with honesty. Okay, I get that. To lead with integrity. Okay, I, I, I get that. I get that. Serve with humility, love unconditional. I get all those things. But this morning, I think there's an attitude that I know I needed to address for myself, and I think we all need to address, and I want you to think about, and that is, what do you really think about Jesus? See, the people in the crowd on that Sunday and Monday, they were intrigued by Jesus. This is pretty cool. Something's going on here. This is pretty spectacular. Now, a lot of them were intrigued, but some of them despised him. Some of them really did, were, were angry and despised him. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that, well, it may be, and if, that, if that's you and you're, you came today, praise God. I'd love to talk to you about why you're so ticked off at Jesus. I'd love to talk to you about that. But I'm going to guess that for the most part, if you took the effort, made the effort to get up and come, that you're not in that camp. But, but that also concerns me. Because that day, as they're coming into the city, and that Monday and the rest of the week, there are a lot of people that were intrigued by Jesus. And I'm pretty convinced that in our world, especially in our world in America, and even more so in Kentucky, and even more so in central Kentucky, this is a place where a lot of people are intrigued by Jesus. They kind of like the Jesus stories. They, they kind of embrace, to a certain degree, the Jesus stories, even if he's just their insurance agent. Even if that's their level of intrigue, and just in case the rest of that stuff in there actually happens, it'd kind of be nice to Jesus know who I am. And so I kind of like that. They're intrigued by it. But guys, we've got to understand, there's a huge difference between being intrigued by Jesus and deciding to follow Jesus. Those are two totally different things. And our world's getting so messed up by that. And we're following all the wrong things. We're saying we're intrigued by Jesus, but I'm going to do this which is definitely not follow Jesus. And, and see, we've got, the, we've got this dilemma that's going on that we've got to make some choices. And it's no different than it was that Sunday and Monday and the rest of this week in Jerusalem. So what do you think about Jesus? And that's one of a couple questions that I want to leave you with. And I, I would encourage you to write these down or screenshot them or whatever. Here's two questions that I want you to wrestle with. I had to wrestle with them this week. First of all, do you believe Jesus is who he says he was? Do you believe that? Doesn't really matter. Don't look. This is, you know, a lot of times I tell you, look at the person next to you and tell them something. Don't look at them right now. Because it really doesn't matter what they think. That person sitting next to you or that person back in your hometown, wherever you grew up, or, or whoever it was that raised you, it really doesn't matter what they think. It's all about who do you think he is? Who do you think Jesus is? Do you believe? And guys, I can't put it any other way. It's time to get off the fence. It's time to make up your own mind and figure out who do you believe Jesus is? And the second question is a follow-up. And that is, if he is who he says he is, what areas of your life need to change? So that you're not just intrigued with him, but you're actually following him. I, I don't know what that is for everyone. I, I'm pretty sure I could guess and say for, for some here today, maybe your marriage is lousy. And the reality is it's your fault or largely your fault. Deal with it. Can Jesus deal with it? Absolutely. Absolutely.
Maybe <laughs> I'm really like jumping off the stage and stomping on toes. I get it. Maybe your attitude about church really stinks. Maybe you still show up, but you don't like this, or you don't like that, or you don't like this thing, or you don't like that person. Or, and, and, and really, your attitude about church in general stinks, and it's rubbing off on other people. Maybe you need to deal with that. Maybe, maybe for some, your, your, your behavior on Friday night dates doesn't match up your behavior on Sunday morning worship. Or maybe for some, it's your Monday morning staff meeting behavior doesn't match up with your Sunday morning worship behavior. Or your Thursday afternoon meet at the golf course behavior doesn't match up with your Sunday morning worship behavior. Or maybe you've been fighting with a neighbor and it's time to build a bridge instead of a wall. I don't know. I don't know what it is. It could be any of those or uh, hundreds more. But there comes the time when we've got to change something. And we've got to figure out who we're really going to follow. In 1978, the world was shocked when a cult leader named Jim Jones, who used to be a preacher in a Christian church just like ours, got a bunch of people to follow him to Guyana and in one day convinced over 900 of them to commit suicide. Jim Jones claimed that he was the Messiah the reincarnation of Jesus. In 1993, the Americans, most of us that were adults, were alive, watched in horror as the standoff between the Branch Davidians and the ATF ended in a fiery destruction of the cult's Waco compound, and several dozens died, many children and the Branch Davidians were led by a guy named David Koresh, who claimed prophetic powers and that they enabled him to crack the code of the seven seals of the book of Revelation. 1997, it got a little crazier, and a guy named Marshall Applewhite led a group called Heaven's Gate. He claimed to be the Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God, and he convinced his followers that they were going to rendezvous with a spaceship coming behind the Hale-Bopp Comet on March 26, 1997. And then in 2012, the Reverend Sun Young Moon died. He claimed to be the Messiah the second coming of Christ, fulfilling Jesus' unfinished mission here on earth. And church members were taught and believed that Sun Young Moon and his wife were the true parents of all mankind and were the restored Adam and Eve. Wow. Wow. What do all these false messiahs have in common? Well, first and foremost, they were all proven to be frauds. But also, they took advantage of their followers' finances. They didn't deliver on their promises, and they all died, leaving a legacy of, of lies and lunacy and loss. I want to finish by letting you hear what John said about Jesus' actual coming the first, in the first place. It's the short version of the incarnation of Christ, the birth experience, because John just does it in a chapter. In fact, he does it in about half of a chapter. In John chapter 1, verse 10, he says, this is who Jesus was. <coughs> he says he was in the world. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. And the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, who realized he was who he said he was, he gave them the right to become the children of God. Wow. So the question today is not how could these people miss Jesus? The real question that we've got to deal with is how could we miss him? Because his identity has been confirmed. And Jesus is who he said he was. So the question we've got to wrestle with is, who is Jesus to you? I realize that for several, maybe a lot of you in here, you've already made that decision. You, you've already said, I believe he is who he said he was. 
And so maybe this, during this decision time as we close our service, maybe this decision time for you is just right where you're at and right where you're standing in just a moment to get serious about that decision. And to say, I'm, I'm going to really make an effort this week to really live like I believe he is who he said he is. Uh, maybe it's just an outright, I, man, I've dropped the ball on that and I've got to get that figured out. Or maybe you're here today and you've never, ever stepped across the line. You, you've never gotten off the fence. You've never acknowledged that Jesus is Messiah. That he is coming back. And it's not going to be in a spaceship trailing a comet. But the skies are going to open. And so who is he to you? Are you intrigued by that? Are you willing to, to follow that? That's the choice that you have to make. Now, this world is full of battles. This world is full of battles. I mean, we good night. It's 2020, right? This world is full of battles and struggles. It's fall in central Kentucky. I can't get through 30 minute sermon without coughing. And it is allergies. Just, uh, you know, it is what it is. This life is full of struggles. Maybe part of figuring out who you believe about Jesus and the result of figuring that out is figuring out how you're going to fight your battles. And if you need to start by giving your life to Jesus, I pray that you'll do that today. Would you guys stand with me? Kevin and the team are going to lead us in worship again. Jason's going to be down here at the front. Uh, Pat and Sutton Steve, some of our elders are around. If you need somebody to pray with you, we got folks to be glad, be glad to do that. So if you need to take a step today, take that step and let's start fighting some battles together, okay? This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight. fight some this week. Let's go to war. Let's fight some. Here's the biggest way we fight our battles is through prayer. It's through prayer. And we've been talking for a little bit about this season of unceasing prayer, uh, this region of unceasing prayer. We're partnering with all these churches in our region uh, to have prayer going on unceasingly. Our day for the month is the fourth Monday of each month, which is next Monday. We've got only about four or five more open half-hour slots, and we've got the whole day filled plus some extra hours. So over on the table at the foot of the cross, uh, please, if you're willing to take 30 minutes uh, a day for that one day a month and just pray for our region, pray for our leaders, uh, pray for our elected officials, our law enforcement, pray for everybody in our community. Uh, we need you to stop over there and sign up today. Next Sunday we'll have prayer guides so that on the next uh, week from tomorrow you'll know what to pray about. So we only need four or five more of those to fill that up, okay? And we do, we've got some special prayer needs. This has been a tough week in our community. It's been a tough week in our church family because we've had a lot of death this week. 
Uh, early in the week, uh, Larry James passed away. It's Betsy's nephew, Donnie's brother, uh, and Sheila Hill, a new member of our church. Her mom passed away. Lori Haggard, a former member, longtime member of our church, passed away. Uh, Brenda Seacat, Kristen Doty's mom, uh, passed away. And just this morning, early this morning, uh, one of our members, Helen Stratton, passed away. And so a lot of families that are hurting. So make that a part of your prayer life. And, and that's how we fight our battles as we go, Lord, pray. If you're new here today, we're so thrilled you came. If this is your first time on your way out, go out those doors right there. And there's a big orange wall that says, I'm new. Uh, Brett and his team are out there. We've got a gift for you. Uh, we'd love to give it to you. Have an awesome week. Let's go change the world. We'll see you next Sunday.